Hello, Matt. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. Not too bad yourself. All right. It's a busy day. I've got a lot of stuff going on, but I wanted to make the meeting, so. Oh, okay, cool. Anything you wanted to go through today or just sitting in? No, I just like to listen and learn from everybody else. I'm, I'm, uh, I just cut out a big box out of, um, on mine and everything's working great. Good, good. What's the box for? Uh, it's something for work. I have a, um, we have something that we have that needs to fit inside a certain volume. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to realize that volume so I could see how big it is and see if it fits inside there. So I cool. made a simple box with finger joints and, you know, got it all, uh, you know, out. So took a half a sheet of plywood and, you know, these days that's uh, quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. But when you can get finger joints to, to fit together nicely, it's always a nice feeling, right? Yeah. So that's cool. Yeah. It was a pretty big box. Some of the finger joints weren't exactly right, but I think that's just my my system isn't accurate as much mm -hmm. as I'd like. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. Right on. Well, if you got any questions on how to get it further calibrated, we could always go through that too. But yeah. Sure. Happy to have you on here. Yeah. I haven't calibrated in quite a while. It's 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 reasonable for my needs, but uh mm -hmm. I, I was cutting out a box that was about half a sheet of plywood in material, so it was it was it was spanning quite a distance so yeah yeah bigger than you just a little bit off yeah i'm usually doing stuff like this thing these things behind me these yeah. you know which don't require a lot of precision right if it's off a little bit nobody cares right it's not like functional joinery yep. yeah we're actually working right now on a new calibration widget that, that should allow you to get way more precise a lot more quickly without having to go through the the edge test multiple times so oh, that's great yeah, we hope to have it done by the end of the year. Okay. Yeah, nice. I noticed. Uh, I noticed fifteen was down uh, available, so I installed that and used that for my test or for my mm -hmm. cut the other yep. night. So a lot of money on pretty well. Man, a lot of money to make thousands and thousands. Okay. Hey, I'm about to get into this meeting, man. Hey, so Mike, you're up. up a little bit. Mike. Okay, there we go. I muted him. <laughs> you were saying, Matt? No, that's all. I was just. Uh, I used 15 when I was uh, before I cut the box out, so it worked okay. out pretty well. Yeah, you're liking the new version at yeah. all? Yeah, it Good. worked for me. I'm glad you guys uh, pr produce so many different versions. I use Linux, so um, okay. uh, I was very happy to download the Debian package and install it, and it worked fine, so thank you for that. Yeah, for sure, glad to hear it. Cool, all right, well, um, I'm just going to hang out and wait to see who else joins. Um, hey, Pat. hey, Patrick. Hey, Mike. How's it going? I'm good. Just working. Yeah. How are, uh, how are tickets going this week? Good. They're going. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm working on some stuff over here in Miami with the photo business. So I'm launching some stuff. Pretty good. Okay. Yeah. You know. How's it going, Matt? It's going well. Um, yeah, I just used uh, the the M2 to cut out a big, big, a big box for work stuff. So I'm excited. Awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Any issues you have? What'd you say? You having any issues at all? No, no, not at all. I just like joining these when I can to see what's going on and what everybody's up to and learn from everybody else. Well, we'll uh, we'll give folks, you know, probably till about fifteen after, to to join in. If nobody else joins, then we'll we'll probably call it early today. Um, I'm doing a lot right now, Matt, to try and invest more time in these these calls. I wasn't able to join last week, but um, hoping that we can start building it up to be something a lot more robust, where we do a lot of show and tell. Um, you know, people who have projects. You know, I don't know if that one that you did with finger joints would make sense, but um, you know allowing folks the chance to to do a show and tell them what you've been up to with it and different ideas that people are using um yeah. to get creative with the machine so yeah we can do that we can we can set up we can also set up another another time you know mm -hmm. um, yeah you know in the evenings and stuff like that i don't mind doing that as well yeah Sweet. 
Yeah, Casey was talking about that. Once uh, once everybody goes back to work, I mean, I'm able to join because I'm at home working from home. But once everybody gets back to work, we're not going to, you know, I won't have won't be able to, to do this at the regular time here. So um, I'm always interested in, you know, hanging out and just mm -hmm. learning from everybody else and seeing what everybody's working on. So that show and tell sounds really nice. And, you know, um, Mike knows that I'm not shy to turn the camera on and show what I'm working on. It's just, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm doing some other stuff right now, but, uh, but, you know, uh, I'm interested in doing additional meetings, maybe after work or mm -hmm. at a different time and that I can make. Where are you located at? I'm in Houston. Uh, I'm okay. In, so, okay. Uh, so you're, so you're, 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 you're central. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yep. Yep. So, so, um, but anyways, yeah, I'll try to make whatever you guys set up. I just, uh, I just know once, once we get back in the office, I won't be able to make these 11, uh, 11 o'clock ones. So that's, that's totally fair. I'm actually going to put a post up on the owners group right now and just see who'd be interested in doing a show and tell after hours. Sure. sure that'd yes. be great. I say anything like, I, it's a, it's a hard one too because you know after hours you know because people have like family time and dinner mm -hmm. you know so we would have to like you know and not only that but some people are in eastern time you know yep uh, it's, yeah it's, it's a, complicated yeah so yeah. so again whatever whatever you guys come up with i'll i'll try to make those too awesome yeah that'd be great appreciating that all right i'm gonna create this little oh there's lauren Hey, Lauren, how's it going? Oh, pretty good. Y'all hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, I'm in the home office today. Yeah, I can <laughs> see that. It looks very different from your, your office at work. <laughs> it's definitely going to work my wife's office, so you can kind of see. Yeah. Like, wow. Everything. Like tons of stuff all around. It's uh, all cool. Yeah. It's a crafter's dream room. Yeah. If, if you say so. It drives me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Some people might. Hey, Casey. Hey guys, how's it going? What? The? Oh, it's another fine day in Happyville. Yeah. I'm still in a suit. <laughs> yeah, it's my need, day job. Need the uh, need the ten gallon hat to go with that. <laughs> Hell yeah! You got all of it going on. It's awesome. Cool. All right, guys. Well, um, we got a few folks in here, so I'm gonna jump into some topics. Um, I was just telling Matt that I'm gonna create a post in the forums. And then I'll drop that post into um, the owners group, but just about um, doing like a little show and tell. So, you know, maybe an off an after hours event where we can all get on here and go around the horn and just say like, what have you been up to? Like Matt was just talking about this finger joint box that he put together, which sounds pretty cool. But, um, you know, there's so many different use cases for this tool. I'd love for everybody to share what they're up to. So just be on the lookout for that. Probably doing the next couple of weeks or so. Um, Lauren and actually, Lauren, I don't know if you were on the list, but Casey, did you get your bits, your router bits, or who else did we send bits to? Yeah, I got the router bits. Okay, okay, right on. Lauren, did you get a set I got of those? The bits from the, I got the bits. From the okay, good. I think I sent it to last week to Mike. Uh, I don't know if he sent them out to me. I, I haven't got them yet. Um, but I've only been home for a couple of days. We had our uh, our second baby grow on Sunday. So did you? Oh, did you email yeah. them to me? Oh. I sent it to you. I did send it to you. I thought you you got it last week. Let me see. Hey, congratulations, I'll just, Lauren. I'll just... Yeah, congrats. Oh, yeah. It's been a good time. Hence the home office and the beard and everything else going on. For sure. Everybody's happy, healthy. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. She's. I mean, she's a crier already, right? That's what they do. They just sit there, cry, and feed, drive mama nuts. You're right. But, yeah. She's got the lungs, though. It's good. <laughs> but yeah, uh, you'll be happy to, well, I don't know if you can see it behind me. I got me a full, like, camera set up. Oh, set this thing uh -huh. So I can actually start, like, actually, because I did it off my webcam, the videos originally, and I was looking at trying them, and they just wasn't that good. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a long delay in the setup. So I got me a ring light or my wife pulled hers out that she uses. So it's kind of, that's kind of bright. Wow. Wow. Yeah. 
but yeah, so we've been doing some tests on it to make sure it's good. Um, and then I can take it out to the garage and actually show the, uh, show kind of how I transition between everything I do. Cause mm -hmm. I noticed a lot of people were building their entire files in like easel. Yeah. Um, and it just, I guess that just doesn't make a lot of sense to me because there's a lot of things that easel won't accept unless you get the pro version. Mm -hmm. And even then, if you're looking for specific text or you're trying to alter that text to make it unique to you, you can't do it. Right. So unless you're running, unless you know Photoshop or anything, uh, or willing to spend the money on a lot of them, they're running free easel. They're not going to spend the money on Photoshop. So I was going to do start off again with a tutorial on, on basic Inkscape. And just to show them how to upload text, turn it into an SVG, edit that SVG, and then drop it over into Easel, where, where it'll accept any SVG at that point. Because yep. um, I just I saw a whole bunch of people were like, oh, we're having trouble with fonts on the Facebook page, and how do we get this to work? Okay. And I'm like, I've never, <laughs> I never go straight to Easel. Everything starts on either Inkscape or Illustrator. Yeah. And then you edit it from there to get it exactly the way you want it. So. That's my kind of see a need. Just building the file is where a lot of people are struggling. For sure. After, I mean, obviously, Casey's got the the uh, the calibration down pat, um, and I really don't feel like there's anything that I'm going to do in the calibration side that's going to help those videos. If they're if they're struggling with those videos, then it's just going to take a hands-on guide from what mm -hmm. I'm seeing. Yeah, um, I don't disagree with that. That'd be great. I think that's going to be a really useful resource so. for folks. Yeah, and then just taking them through kind of the, some of the tips and tricks um, that I've done in my shop. That's where I'm, I'm excited to, to get, because I haven't done that yet, um, is to show the shop. Because uh, I have a little, I don't know, just a unique outlook on things. I'm not sure when I say it's unique. It may not be just my way of doing things. Um, but, yeah, I'm excited to, to cool. actually get those up, loaded up and done. Yeah, nice. So, Sounds good. I have uh, three weeks off. I should have a little bit of time. <laughs> oh, it'll be okay attorney lee but, for the win sweet cool is that a cricket easy press behind you i see and do you all like that thing uh yeah she, she does a whole lot of like when we started everything was by hand mm -hmm. and any kind of design work was done on the cricket it works it works well um but where the maker made or the m2 really expanded upon it is because we went from everything was a 2d development so everything was 2d everything was circles or squares or plain shapes and then yeah. um it really brought into because we even did a couple of like gifts and things like that we did a custom dinosaur with a name on it um before we got the m2 and it took me easily in the three or four hour range to get it cleaned up mm -hmm. and cut by hand and then when i got done hold on one second hey dude i'll let somebody we also have on here, uh, I hope I don't butcher your name, Aravind? Uh, hey, Pat. Yeah, that's right. That's how's Aravind, it? yes. Aravind, how's it going? Yeah, it's going all right. How's it going for you, Pat? Yeah, good, good, good. Are you, uh, what's, uh, what brings you to the, the call today? Uh, well, I'm one of your resellers in the US. Uh, so I saw your post in the Facebook and then I thought I'll join and understand, you know, what clients oh. are asking. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we use this time for basically anything. It started out as a chance for us to connect with um, first time users or prospective users. Um, and it's grown into this kind of power user touch base that's been a lot of fun. So the guys in here who, who join in typically are, are salty vets um and really understand the product really well and so we're we use i use this time definitely to just kind of touch base and and figure out what everybody's up to and um just connect with the community again so it's a really fun time for everybody to just go around the horn and, and talk about what they're up to and bounce ideas and we talk product design and development it's a lot of fun okay awesome so yeah uh, so Pat, i mean is this a call open for you or is it only for the closed circle if i no, it's open okay yeah, okay. if you've got people you want to point this way, absolutely. Okay, no worries, no worries. No. Get, I just know uh, Mike, uh, and then I know Casey from the group. So, yep. yeah. hey guys. How you doing? Doing all right, thanks. All right. 
so we got a few topics I'm going to go through today real quick. Um, so first off was what I mentioned earlier. We're going to be doing a show and tell, but we'll do it after hours because I think what I keep hearing is that this kind of time is difficult for most people to make, which makes sense when it's not your actual day job, then it's more difficult to do, right? So um, I would love, I'm going to post that out there in the owners group, would love for anybody who's willing to, to give us, it would be like, everybody take five minutes to show us your setup, what you use it for, like challenges you've had with the machine, things you enjoy about it, and the rest of your setup, like what do you use it with, et cetera. So just a nice little show and tell session. Um, should be a lot of fun. We'd probably record it and share it with other potential or prospective users too. So just a heads up there, but um, yeah, I'm really excited to kind of just see what everybody's been up to. Any thoughts around doing a show and tell? Like I think kind of like a happy hour situation in a couple of weeks would probably be um, what we'd be doing. And then if it's really popular, obviously we'd do it again. And, and maybe even if we've got some specific users who everybody's just like head over heels about, then like Casey, if you've got, you know, if somebody wants to see your rig up close, I think we really need to do a session where you're just showing everybody around your dust collection and things like that. Um, sure. Cool. Yeah. I think that, uh, I think that has a lot of potential when it comes to, I feel like we're all kind of, well, there's a lot of us that are like the innovative type. They want to, they want to see where the machine can go. Mm -hmm. Um, and I really think that's where it's at. Um, the only other thing I would add is if you're going to go in depth, like if Casey was going to go in depth, mm -hmm. I would plan a, a small project around that uh, time so that he can actually show when he's going through his machine. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if it's as simple as a, a square with a star in the middle of it or something like, you know, super simple or something he's got going on, especially as he gets into the laser. Right. Because, I mean, we've seen a lot of the laser builds, but I mean, you've taken it to the next level, Casey. So it'd be taking you through that project as a whole. And if you had, I mean, 45 minutes, most of those projects, I mean, if the actual cut itself may take a little longer, but mm -hmm. getting through that point. Because I feel like every time I look at this, I realize like somebody else has a different take on that process, their own yeah. way of going about it. And you realize that ah, that's kind of a lot faster than my method or, you know, why am I going so slow or what, you know, mm -hmm. or maybe they haven't seen my method and they'd like to try it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Just, and there's, you know, each one of those methods has their positives and minuses typically. Right. And so and depending on the circumstance, you may find another person's method works really well for that specific project type. Right. So totally agree with that. Uh, cool. Um, let's see. Uh, so one thing I really want to start using this group for is bouncing ideas for future product development that we're working on. So we've got a product in mind that we're looking to develop. I think I've told you all a little bit about it. It's kind of like a next gen system that we hope to launch next year. Um, one aspect of that that I'm really interested to get feedback on with this group is around the concept of what I'm calling free play. So that's just to say like, I want this next system to be able to have like, which some Maslow users I think have developed this already, but like a video game controller system, right? So you're just jogging your machine around and let's say you attach like a pin attachment or something to it. And then, you know, trigger is plunge to drop that pin down and, and drive it around. And you can do straight lines, you can do, you know, free form or whatever. I'm trying to figure out what, like how valuable that would be to folks. And if there, if you'll have any thoughts around what that might look like, because again, Lauren, going back to your comments, like one of the most challenging things people face is just how do I get my creativity baked into this process, right? Like, I don't know that Inkscape or Illustrator process. And I feel like if people could just drive the thing around, that would be a lot of fun and provide a new way of interacting with this machine. So I don't mean to jump in too early. If I did, I think there's, I think there's a big outlet for that where I think the initial payoff is going to be to your, to your original users though, is getting to home. And what I mean by that, when I put a sheet goods on the market, right? I don't know if we could, <laughs> you could integrate like a Wii controller, right? Just a simple controller with a joystick. As you're trying to, usually my computer's off to the side or it's not, I'm looking back and forth. Um, as we test that idea of it, being able to move around is literally A is to plunge, B is to raise the Z axis. Mm -hmm. But then the joystick guides it around the actual surface. So when you're mm -hmm. getting to home, I can stand over right in front of my machine move the joystick to the left, the sled moves to the left, move it down, you know what I'm saying, as I'm getting to home. Because usually 
that's the mo that's the only challenge is I have to measure it out real quick. Um, mm -hmm. Or it has the, the keyboard jog function, but then once again, I'm looking back and forth from the computer to the actual controller. And a lot of the, uh, I saw one the other day, an actual, obviously a normal CNC, gantry style CNC, where a guy had a controller. Now it was a lot more bulky and it didn't seem, mm -hmm. it seemed like over the top, but a simple controller with a simple joystick and an A and a B function would be very handy to hang on the machine, pop yeah. it down when you're getting to the home function and just use it to jog over manually um mm. and then up and down or you, you know and you can just get yeah. a bump and now say it could have a d-pad if you wanted to go really slow something like that yeah um, but i think that would be a great additional product Is, i don't it, i'm assuming it couldn't cost too much being you could buy controllers or just make a like an attachment for an xbox yeah. controller like a the software xbox development controller. is is the big lift right oh yeah 100 percent. but i think that would be a great and then it could obviously translate but i think that would be a great way to help mm -hmm. the user I know I would yeah. have one hung up at the top of my machine for, for jogging my machine around while I'm getting to home. Yep. Yeah, I have one. I actually have one for my CNC machine as well. That's what that's I use. For the Onefinity, right, Mike? For the Onefinity, that is correct. Yeah. And that's correct. And it, 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 it's just, it's it's amazing to just to be able to jog it where it needs to go. So did, what what other features does that have baked into it, Mike? Like, is it? And I, have, I haven't used that thing. I only use that thing, I'm not going to lie to you, maybe about six times since uh -huh. i've had it i just haven't had time with the, my the business that i'm running and you know i'm, I'm opening up another yeah. business you know and then with working with maker made you know so but it has a, it has a lot of features it has that you can put the you can put a laser on there mm -hmm. um i also got a, a function where you can put a uh, a vinyl cutter on there as well so it cuts vinyl oh that's so, super cool so i have it there i have and yeah you put you put a knife on there i have a knife and everything there I just haven't put it together, but I have yeah. it there. Okay, neat. I'd love. To. Would you be able to take a picture of the vinyl cutter component? Uh, yeah. Actually, I can. Let me bring it out real quick. Yeah, yeah. To be, fair, see to be fair, that's a vinyl cutter. <laughs> yep. That pops right out of the cricket. Like, yep. you could easily take this machine, develop. Like, I'm sure Casey has already had probably has something similar. He could adjust in CAD to drop this in, and we're cutting vinyl. You know what I'm saying? What so what is that mechanism there? What is that what is that tool? So all it is is it's actually you buy the pin. So I'm gonna try to show it up to the camera. I'm sorry. It's yeah. just a pin that flexes to it. And so the it just slips into the cricket uh, yeah. holder and it knows the center of this is home, right? But as yeah. you notice, I don't know if I can show it. I don't know if it's man. Is it like a exacto blade tip? It's or? like a tiny little exacto blade, is what it is. It's a tiny. You can kind of see it there. I don't know if oh, I yeah. can put something behind it where you can actually yeah. see it. For yours, for yours, Patrick, all mm -hmm. it has to be for there you the, go. any CNC to have that, it needs to be exactly dead center yeah. of the CNC. So what a lot of people do is make an insert that goes into their router because the router's yep, already. Yeah. So you just have an insert that goes into your router instead of a bit. Mm -hmm. And then inside of that tubing, there's a blade and it rotates because as your yeah. so as you moves, 100%. the blade can move with it. The blade just needs to blade spring loaded. So you don't bust it if you drive in too deep. Right. The blade is spring loaded. That's it. I mean, it's really simple. So as you see this thing on the back, that's exactly what that is. That's a hundred percent all it is is a spring loaded blade. And that blade actually rotates because obviously as the machine moves, the blade has to to twist as it cuts and it's 100 percent you can i don't know if you're allowed to steal this from cricket but i mean too and i okay so you're breaking up say again oh i'm sorry i said i i built one for the m2 when i first got it oh and yeah i used it to cut out uh some shape and then i lost the damn thing and i've just never reprinted another one I just used an exacto knife. You unscrew it and you use the blade on the end of an exacto knife. And I went to Lowe's and bought a little spring that was exactly the same part of the square, the mm -hmm. back end of the exacto knife, and yep. printed it and stuck the spring in the square. That was it. Can you? And then would it you just be willing to? Like I said, it's really simple. Could you? Would you be willing to share that file so I could print one here, Casey? Yeah, I have to look and see if I can find it. That was a year and a half ago. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it worked. It worked. The only thing was. Was, was if you tried to use it on old crappy plywood you know how plywood is uneven yeah. you have to go real slow 
because the blade would jump in and out. So gotcha. I moved at you could do like vinyl, but yeah, but you could you could go move it like I don't know, 10 inches per minute or five inches per minute. Gotcha. It took a little while to cut it out, but man, it was crisp and clean. Oh, well, that's if you're doing good. smooth wood, something, uh, something smooth, oh, yeah, you can hit 10, 10, 15 inches per minute and it would just slowly, it would cut it out. It worked. Right? I think, I think I would encourage it. Really well. And easy. I did the same. Thing. That's what I said. What are we saying, Lauren? Oh, like, I think you're right. Sorry, I think, what was it? no, I think, you, I think you're on the money. Uh, because the cricket just uses a mat, but I think you could do it with expanded. You know how you can buy, I mean, they're expensive. It's like 80 bucks a sheet mm -hmm. of the expanded PVC. And then you just encourage them to pop that over their wasteboard. Right. You sit on top of the wasteboard and then put your vinyl on top of that because expanded PVC is really smooth. Well, you could also, I mean, one thing that I've been thinking about for this future variant machine that I've been talking about, which would be almost entirely wall mounted flush against the wall is just having a component where you just got like butcher block paper reel and you just pull it over right and so that would even create some padding as well it could be it could also be the work surface right what you're actually using but um you know using the workspace like that to just roll out different materials really easily you know with like a pin tool plus a cutter tool like this that would be a lot of fun would be a lot more accessible way to use a tool like this anyway that's awesome yeah casey if you could if yeah, you find that think, please, by all means yeah let me, let me uh let me try to look that up but i think you know you're talking about future future de development etc mm -hmm. to be honest with you i mean something i know everybody still has problems with and having a a, a bit set um a homing tool, right? So your bit zeroing, if you could have a zero, you know, a little magnetic or metal one, uh, oh. something to zero your bit. I mean, that I've seen people asking for that for a year and a half. And it's just, uh, I mean, that's something that everybody would like, because a lot of people are getting to the point where they're changing bits. You know, they mm -hmm. do rough pass, they do fine pass, then they do lead bit. And I mean, geez, I, I know I would love to have a, a, a zeroing kit for the, yeah. for the bit, right? We're, that would be nice. That way, whenever I change out, it doesn't matter how deep I put it in or whatever. I can just put the little metal plate under there, put it in, wait for the red light or a little piezoelectric beeper mm -hmm. to beep whenever the thing hits it and the Z axis stops moving. I mean, it's all software driven. It's just really like to have something like that i think a lot of people would appreciate that so we've just we we are uh hopefully days or just a, you know a couple weeks away from onboarding a new software engineering resource so this has been a long time coming really excited to release a lot a little bit more information about that and what that's going to mean for for maker made going forward but yes the the challenge there has just been the software development side Totally. But um, again, one other thing I really want to do, we talked about this before, is I want to get to a place where all of our bits are exactly the same length and we have those notches on the shaft so that you can guarantee without even ever having to use a probe like that, that it's going to be exactly the same depth in there as the bit you just took out. Um, I think that would be even faster as well. I mean, it may not always work, right? If you're, especially if you're not taking your router out of, um, out of the clamp. But um, ideally, I think you should be able to see it, and that would work. That would be a, at least an interim substitute. So I'm hoping that we can get those bit changes done in the next three months or so as well. So, but yeah, with these bits that you sent us, what do you what do you want us to do? You want us to test them and give you our feedback? Uh, do you want a video on the bits? Because are you done um, designing the bits? Are they ready? Not necessarily. We've, so we've done a, I've, what I've done is I've ordered, I've done a, essentially a test batch order, a very small production run of each of those um, that I'm going to sell on the site as well. Uh, yeah, just, I mean, honestly, Casey, what, whatever y'all want to do with them, 
it would be great. Any feedback that I can get on them. Oh yeah, these are actually useful for this type of project or this has no particular use to me whatsoever at the end of the day. What I want to get to, what I'm trying to figure out is like how much can we consolidate down the variety of bits that we're offering on the site? You know, like others out there right now in Xcarve or Shapeoko, they're offering just every bit under the sun. But I think for 95%, 99% of our customers, that's going to just be more confusing than it is helpful. And I think they can get most of their project work done with some with a very limited selection. And so like what these are, are hopefully bits that provide both a like, you know, like a really nice clean channel for engraving, but then also allow you to carve out, you know, the full project a la InMill without having to swap the bit out, right? So a lot of the purpose is can we complete two objectives with one bit essentially? Yeah. But yeah, any feedback yeah. that we can get on it would be great. I'd really appreciate it. Yeah, I actually had a question on the uh, bull nose. Yeah. What are they used for? Or what's yeah. the intent of that bull nose? So a bull nose bit is halfway between a flat end mill and a ball nose bit. So a ball nose bit, right, is intended when you're doing 3D relief work, right? That a ball nose bit gives you, prevents those, you know, raised tiered edges from happening uh, on your work surface and gives you a nice smooth, uh, finish a ball nose. I'm sorry, bull nose is somewhat an in between. Like it's intended to provide the value of an in mill and the, the capacity to just really clear out material, but still provide a slightly rounded channel, so you don't get that stair step. All you know, kind of like a Chinese rice patty effect on your work surface when you're trying to do um, relief engraving work. So. Okay. So it's, yeah, it's just a little bit of an in between. All right. I, I've tried cutting with that bolt nose um, mm -hmm. and I've gotten a pretty flat uh, surface mm -hmm. when I'm doing a clear out of a section. It's yep. almost um, imperceivable, the clear out at the bottom there. You don't see the tracks like you do on some of the other bits. So right. I think that is the great case of it. I just didn't know what the intent of those bits were. I've been playing around with them a little bit. Just that. And I'm glad okay. to hear that that's the case. So feedback like that is exactly what I'd love to get back because ultimately, you know, again, we're doing a test batch run of each of these units. Um, if I get back from y'all, nah, that really didn't do much. I probably won't reorder it again. Um, but I can make some pretty great claims if, if that's the case, if we're getting, you know, essentially my post-processing because I'm using a bull nose rather than a flat end mill, um, reduces by, I don't know, half or 30%, whatever it is, we can start making claims like that. And it just makes that process a little bit easier every time we as a community here come together and generate these concepts. So that's the goal. Um, and we do have some pretty cool new features or, or, or we've begun in earnest, I should say, the updates to these accessories. So we're working hard right now to improve the verbiage, the language on the bits so that you know, we're not calling, again, we're not calling them things like compression bullnose bit. It's, this is what that bit's for, right? Here's the use case. Here's the project types you should be using this for. Here's the speed and feed settings we recommend, um, you know, and then like little bit guides and things like that. So we're trying to make them a lot more accessible yeah. and user-friendly. All right. Um, yeah. We've got, who else? That was okay. Just Dustin, you just joined. Um, so if you look behind me too, just an update. Uh, I'm gonna disconnect my computer here. I know Drew, Drew's not on here today, but um, we've been working on the mini frame. Some of y'all might have seen the, uh, the update there. So it's, I kind of lovingly call it the half stack, um, but we've got it pretty much dialed in now. So it's not a 300 by 300 like what um, Drew was saying. It can do up to four by four feet, but I think typically for most users, it's going to be a two by four foot sheet that they're using. It's essentially intended to be a product that you can just go pick up a two by four foot piece of ply, throw it in the back of your Civic, and uh, you can still participate, right? Like, like the rest of us. So finally got that thing just about done. And our Drew here, Drew Wallace, is going to be adding that to the guide pretty soon. So just thought that was a fun little addition. So, uh, 
Patrick, I will say this. Uh, so I was talking to my father who owns metalworking. Uh, yep. He does a lot of that. In them. Um, I'm really thinking of, because then you, know, you discussed about putting one of those together. Um, we were comparing prices last week on plasma CNCs, and they mm. are about twice as much. Um, so I'm actually looking. Uh, I was going to get in touch with you, Casey, or, or uh, Drew out there in San Antonio uh, of looking at help me out with designing, like getting you the specs on a plasma. We're looking at doing it probably over Christmas time frame when I get a chance to go back home to Arkansas and um, put one of those plasma CNCs together using this setup. Um, basically only the outside rails are wood, but everything else would be metal and welded together, or bolted together mm -hmm. just to see what it's capable of. Um, we're looking so you want to you want to do a vertical plasma yep. cutter? Yep. So we actually I was running the specs. I'm putting together something in uh, SketchUp. Basically, it's a um, the concept is I, we're worried about the slag buildup from cutting with plasma. Uh, so we're looking at we found some bunch of these uh, all way bearings. Um, you probably see them. They different make different like uh, wood movers and stuff with them. But they're the, basically the bearing that sticks up over the top of a piece and they make them like five inch, five eighths inch balls. We're gonna put about, I think they come a set of 10 for 15 bucks. Um, I'm basically gonna take one of my old sleds, put a whole bunch on the back of it and just set up, uh, kind of, you know, try it out and see if it works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but it'd be fun to build. And it'd be a whole nother uh, CNC that I can actually convert back to normal cutting. But obviously we tested it out in a four by eight sheet of eighth inch steel comes in just under 200 pounds and I was like there's nobody in the, I, don't, I don't know of anybody that's excited about moving weight like that around their shop especially steel uh but um you could easily do one of those four by four setups is about perfect so that's what I was looking at doing um do you have can you show me how you routed your chains because I was actually just gonna uh buy two more sprockets and reroute the chains for me and buy an extra set of spring or an extra spring yeah, so one thing that we have to do here is I have to set up an idler right here. So yeah. I'm going to have to lift this up a little bit. Uh -huh. But otherwise, I'm just connecting it all the way at the end here. And then yeah. I need, I've got a, I just bought a chain breaker, but I've got the, the chain length here marked, which is a little sharpie for where the actual sled attaches. Um, so what we're going to start doing is we got a boatload of 11 foot chain sets here we're going to start breaking those down and then offering them as a replacement so that we have now like mini frame chain length standard frame chain length and xl frame chain length yeah because see i was gonna i was just gonna route the chain back and forth with an mm -hmm. extra sprocket um mm -hmm. oh, yeah to get rid of the excess to me that was the, the easiest way to do it um just to give it a shot to see if it worked i mean i think i think it could still work i mean it takes a good portion of that excess out um but still makes it available if you need it yeah but the, other, the other thing i was doing when i was getting this thing calibrated is i just had the excess coming out of the uh the connect points for on the sled and it was just hanging down and it doesn't really do anything right it just kind of yeah, that's around. True. it's not a big deal <laughs> that's true you can literally just roll it up and clamp it into place with a zip tie yeah Zip tie. That, that's what uh, Drew that. Wallace here did on his. Yeah, he just zip tied his up at the ends. It's really not a not a big deal. I don't know why I didn't think of that sooner. Right. <laughs> <Very> <laughs> <You know what? laughs> well, I was doing the same thing too. I was like, man, how are we gonna get this chain back and forth? And I was like, I guess it really doesn't matter. Just have it hang. Everything else is hanging down. All you know, you got tubes yeah. and wires and dust collection hanging off. What? Who cares? <laughs> yeah. So. So yeah. I don't know. Pretty that that's something we're looking at at Christmas time. I mean, he, he lives just south of Mina, so it's not mm -hmm. that far from Fayetteville. I think it's like four and a half yeah. hours from Fayetteville. Um, so when we get it built, obviously, we'll invite you down to come take a look at oh, it. Oh, yeah. I'd love to take a little road trip. Because I'm excited. We were looking at I mean, the smallest one, a 24-inch by 24-inch plasma CNC runs about $4,500 to $5,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and... Yeah, the only, the only thing that's going to be fun is basically building the slats with the expanded metal and then building the trough for the, the slag to fall into. Mm -hmm. um, but I really think I really think it's, it's possible. It's just going to be fun to see if we can get it to work. Yeah, right on. Cool. Um, well, Casey, I've got a possible project for you on this frame as well, um, if you'd be interested. So I'd love to 
to pick your your brain on that afterwards. Just a heads up there. Um, yeah, cool. no problem. The, uh, the laser, the larger laser that you sent to me to test, mm -hmm. I uh, printed and inserted yesterday. I designed a 91 millimeter clamp for it. Oh, great. So it fits right into the clamp. So the large 7 watt laser fits into it. Mm -hmm. So now I can get it to go up. Uh, you know, 10 or 12 or 20,000 says it every time it's going. Awesome. So I'm thinking this weekend, I'll probably uh, try to give it, give it a good run. But the reality is that I've been going back and forth with um, the manufacturer and they claim that it's a five amp output on that laser, mm -hmm. but they have it actually jumped on the board back to a mm -hmm. three and a half amp. And they said they do that because if you run it at five amps, it'll blow up but they sell it as a five amp unit. Yeah. So that's, um, this is Jay. Yeah. Jay -tech? Yeah. Jay -tech, yeah. 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 They, 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 even you know, the power pack to it, the, the 12 volt converter, right. It's a five amp DC power supply. Mm -hmm. So whenever I started going through, I literally hooked it up and I turned the laser on. And I put my, uh, my, I put my uh, digital calipers and everything on it. And I was my multimeter and I was, was reading only three and a half amps coming out of the board. So then that's when I started calling JTEC. And you can actually move the little pins to tell it how many amps you want it to burn. To burn. Mm -hmm. And I sent them a picture of it and they said, well, yeah, it's right now it's only set at three and a half amps. And we wouldn't, we don't recommend going all the way up to five. I said, well, in your sales documentation, you sell it as a five amp laser. And they said, yeah, but if you run it at five amps, it, the laser doesn't last very long. Well, okay. so that's so actually what happened on ours too. We were running ours fully at you five burned it up. We burned, we burned out the lens. We had to get a new lens in. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. There that go. that was actually what was causing, so, I don't know if you all had seen it. That was cause what was causing like the, what it was like the laser was like pulsing inconsistently. It looked like. So I couldn't figure uh, out what was going on with something in the software. And then it was like, oh, no, nope, you were just running at the full five amps. You burned out your, <laughs> your laser. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I got it fully. It, it's fully dialed in. I mean, I got it focused correctly. Mm -hmm. um, now I just, this weekend, I'll probably just start running some circles or some squares or some crap on the, mm -hmm. uh, on the M2 there just to see if we can get it to go through. But yep. uh, I don't have anything like um, large four ply or five ply one eighth inch material, right? It won't cut quarter. We know that. It never, JTEC never said it would. Yeah. They do guarantee that it's supposed to cut one eighth inch. So I got three ply one eighth inch. I'm going to try to cut. And it's good. I mean, it's actually oak veneer. So, well, we, we know it can cut three ply. Wood. Yeah, Joel was able to prove three ply. It was the five ply eighth inch that we have not been able to confirm. That was the kicker for us. Just FYI. I, I can't find five ply. Really? I can't find five on eight. No. Hmm. I'm, I went to Lowe's because I was looking at uh, getting some little two by four sheets, you know, hmm. and everything is the same. It's three ply or less. I even found okay. two ply, but nothing five ply. Okay. So maybe we, it's just an odd wood you got. So you're talking three ply, not including the veneers on the outside or including the veneer? Not including the veneers. Oh, that's why then. Yep. Yep. Then that's right. Yeah, I'm talking about. Yeah. So okay. if you're talking about the overlay, the veneers, hell, your eyes can barely even see that layer, right? I'm looking at the <laughs> internal layers. I can count with a point. Yeah. Well, that's fair. Let's, yeah, let's see what it comes out the, of. Uh, the epoxy, what? Yeah, mm -hmm. because it has two layers and then a center layer, and then, of course, two outer layers that are micro thin that are mm -hmm. just your outside veneers. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah. We'll see. Good. We'll see. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, anybody got, let's go around the horn. Anybody got other topics they want to go through today? Anything you're, you've been working on? Uh, any updates or? Dustin, what have you been up to lately? Uh, I've been working on some more prototyping for a loom I'm working with my wife on designing. Uh, yeah, and I've been cutting out some handles 
and I had I have had to switch over to Carbide Create because Easel just isn't powerful enough to do multiple bits very well, in my opinion. So I was curious, is there anybody else that uses another application other than Easel? I've used quite a bit of Carbide Create. I've had quite a bit of luck. Okay. Uh, with that in mind, I don't do multiple bits in the same file. Uh, based upon the fact that like getting it to go back to comp to exact zero um, as you exchange those bits out. Now, what I, what I do do is I will run, use Carbide Create and call multiple files with the same home location. And that works perfectly well. And I, I can go back out to my garage and pull some of the designs and things I've done. And it's it's very accurate. I mean, it's yeah, it's easily within less than a tenth of a millimeter. It's very, very accurate. But um, so, so what I've been doing with Carbide Create is I've been setting up different groups for the tool bits. So uh -huh. I set up one, so I'm doing quarter and eighth inch bits. Um, so one group is quarter inch, the other one is eighth inch. And then I just disable one when I export the G code. So I'm yes. setting up different G codes that way. So it's one project in Carbide. Um, but no, I, did, I did the same, exactly okay. the same, what you're, exactly what you're saying. I'm just saying, you, you know how you can create it to where it's all, one file uh -huh. i've never created like that i don't have i'm i'm not confident enough to do that yet but my my big question is i've been designing an illustrator and importing into carbide but it doesn't hold the scale that i design in in illustrator are you seeing that or do you have you ran into that before so i use almost exclusively inkscape mm -hmm. um and i usually get very very close you can scale it really easily in Carbide Create. Now, the scaling function isn't as intuitive. Um, with that in mind, it uh, this is where Easel is more powerful than Carbide Create. When you're cutting out more complex shapes, um, if you give me just a second, I'll run out to the shop. I'll show you what someone did really fine that I should have showed you the other day. Okay. Now, Dustin, you said that this is for a loom, a wooden loom, right? For making yes. carpet and stuff, correct? Yep. So I'm just curious, I mean, that you're talking about, you're talking about things with specs. Why, why are you not, why are you trying to create them in that software when <laughs> you would use Microsoft SketchUp or something like that to where your components have, right? identical holes perfect angles i guess that's my question why wouldn't you use a i mean that you know illustrator and all of that those are art design etc when you're mm -hmm. trying to you're building a mechanical component why would I am, you use an, I am a or, former or art director <laughs> i am not a i'm not an engineer or anything like that and so i've i've worked in illustrator for 20 25 years now so it's what i am very comfortable with and very quick at. So I can sketch something up in a 2D, 2D format and mm -hmm. I can just plop that into uh, Carbide or, or Easel and just have it ready for the cuts immediately. Yeah, because I put a tutorial out there. It's on our Facebook page on how to take a simple design from Google SketchUp, um, how to take a, a 2D flat file from Google mm -hmm. SketchUp convert it to an STL, uh, SVG, upload it then into ESOL and then take it, do your settings, et cetera, and then generate your G code and then load it into Makerverse. Okay, I'll have to check that out. Looks like Lauren is trying to show us something. There. It, yeah, so I don't, I don't want to interrupt here. So this is a very, it's a unit logo that we have here at, down in Georgia, right? Um, and you can see it's very, this is uh, four inch by four inch. It's very tiny um, and it will get very precise um, where you make your money. I mean, this took, I think this took 30 minutes to cut even at this size. It's just, it's very, very tiny. It's the most complex shape I've cut so far. And you can barely, it's hard to see in those wings, but there is little hairline cuts in there. And I mean, it's just this, this camera isn't as, as precise as it should be. What's the material? Um, do what? What's the material you used? MDF. Nice. Um, so it, it really will cut tiny. 
obviously I, I spilled a little stain up there at the top. You can see as I was kind of doing some other test cuts. Uh, the challenge that it ran into, right? As you can see, a lot of the relief cuts that I cleaned up with an eighth inch uh, router bit is that telling it what it wants to relief cut and doesn't want to relief cut. Easel, when I tested it in easel, is more intuitive, but it requires the pro version. Um, and unless you're willing to spend that money, uh, that's where you run into. But as you can see, it, it was the challenges to get to decide what was the relief cut and what wasn't. Carbide Create does it pretty decently, but it's selecting your different paths as you set it up. And that's one of those things like, my, Patrick, I was going to say, as we did those show and tells, that's a great point. As some of us that have stepped out, because I would bet 90% of the users are using Easel. Um, it's the go-to. It's comfortable. It shows everything. It, it looks very user-friendly. While Carbide Create, once you learn it, is very easy, but it just doesn't have that same appeal. Um, as you do with with other products, mm -hmm. but once you learn it, it's got a it's got a lot of potential, um, and it gives you more options. Sorry, I'm shaking a little bit, but as you can see, it's there. It's just, you know, like me and Dustin are probably have different methods of how we want to do things and what we'd want to relieve and what not to relieve. This was just my to uh, choice of it, and I wasn't able to just select it all and say cut, and it is some wild different choices. So I had to cut this. And I want to say six different cut paths with a B bit before I create a whole separate relief uh, cleanup path um, with eighth inch. So that's the other thing is like, you know, as you get into advanced e carve, I'll set this down, I'll show you some other stuff. If you get into advanced e carve or V carve, it'll, it gives you the option of doing all in one. And because we don't have a zero out option or our automatic home for the Z axis, you can't do that because it'll actually cut too deep for the V card or too shallow. What I've also found, Dustin, is I don't know if you noticed this. One of them I didn't cut right. I don't know if I can show you uh, which one it is, but this one right here. I didn't cut it right. And I didn't even take that much time, but I literally <laughs> cut it, took a, a chisel to it, a tiny little chisel, and cleaned it out. I didn't even try to clean it more than that, but it, it literally pops right out, especially on the small stuff. Um, so there are times and choices where I would recommend just not even doing the cleanup cut because uh, the chisel is going to clean it up almost perfectly. Now, then you get into cases like this where it's an outline, right? And I know it's obviously backwards on y'all's screen, but you can see it's really clean. The real challenge that I face with these kind of cuts is that veneer on the outside, it creates so many fuzzies. And this is actually, as you can see, it's a pretty decent quality plywood got a lot of layers but it's just that it just doesn't cut as cleanly um mm -hmm. where i ran into the scaling that you're talking about dustin is this is a simple three uh three thirty meter division patch right they call it the 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 fuzzy television but what you can see is that if you glance at it at first you're like oh that's perfect no it's not see right here it's not lined up right so there was a scaling problem um but like I say, there's there's a process to it and how you select it. Um, and, and I'd have to walk you through it. Because when you export or import it as an SVG, these are all separate files and it wants to cut it a specific way. Um, now I have the one here that did turn perfect that we we played around with. And my wife was like seeing what it would look like paint. So it looks a little funky. So you have to forgive me for that. But you can see here, perfectly straight, perfectly relief cut. And very clean, despite the weird paint all over it. Um, but I mean, I, if I could give you the detail, it's very, very clean. What um, are you using these for, Lauren? Uh, so we were actually taking these kind of boards and stuff and give them as gifts. We sell them like for like 20 to 30 bucks a piece. We put little handles on them and they sell like crazy. Hmm. I don't fully understand it, but if people will buy it, I will make it. Um, right. So there's a lot of things like that. And we did another like... The real challenge I face, and I'll show you, these are my, like a ton of little test cuts. And that says Fort Stewart, Georgia, obviously in reverse for y'all. But yeah, um, as you can see, they're not really clean. And this is why I'm kind of getting desperate for a laser cutter, because cutting that 30 seconds of an inch depth cut, or I think it comes out to like a half a millimeter depth cut or less than that. Um, it just, that veneer with even my sharpest bit, steel has a little bit of tear to it. And you can see it even worse on this side 
you can see it's just really jagged in there where the laser will solve all that problem. Um, Lauren, did you try doing it with putting uh, like painters tape over it and then cutting it? So I tried just about every method. I did, I did try uh, versions of that. Now it wasn't the greatest, it was cheap masking tape. But that veneer, now granted, this one is, as you can see, not as quality. <laughs> it's got a lot less layers, it's three quarter inch thick. That should be at least five or six more layers to it. But the veneer on most layers of plywood, as you know, are still thin. And I'll show you the B bits. I, I brought my bit, I didn't want to back up any subjects, but I brought my bits in. So if we want to go back to that at some point, I'll show you the different ones and kind of give my personal recommendation until I test try them. But still to this day, the, the best one, I just finished this one yesterday. Uh, he wanted it actually stained, but as you can see, that's a deep quarter inch cut. And you can see how clean that came up. No cleanup or nothing. Very clean. Um, nice. So. So when you, right. when you cut deeper, you get a better clean cut on the surface, that veneer than you do if you go shallow. Oh yeah. So that's another thing too. So yes and no, what I did, and I know I talked about, I don't know if you remember last week, is I create a second cut, a quick second cut using the exact same path, but you know how you can choose the step down, right? Have you done, have you played with that? Yeah. Step down uh -huh. rate? Yep. So I just remove that and max it out, right? So I repeat the exact same cut with a max step down at the lowest level. And then all I do is hit the same thing. I don't change any of the numbers. I just remove that to just max out the step down. And before I start that second cut, all I do is lower the z-axis, the starting point, three tenths of a millimeter. And it is the exact same thing as building and taking the time in the program to build a cleanup cut. It just goes down three tenths of a millimeter deeper, um, all in one pass. So it takes about five minutes. I mean, it's a very much faster pass because it doesn't do any of the step downs. Um, and it, yeah, it cleans it all up. And all 90% of the fuzzies, or maybe 95% of the fuzzies are gone. And then I just take my sponge Diablo um, uh, sanding tool, like hand sander, and it just brush over it and it cleans up the rest of them. Um, I also did it with a brass brush. That works pretty well of cleaning up some of the thicker fuzzies, just running that over. And I was worried on the test cuts it was going to mar the plywood, but it didn't do anything to the plywood. It actually just came right off. Um, I haven't tried Drew's method of using a sandblaster yet. I'm looking into that just to see if it's faster. Um, but it definitely works. A sandblaster? Yeah. So they're like, they say you can use a sandblaster, like one of those handheld sandblasters, not the like actually in a, like in a, oh, uh, but yeah, just handheld sandblaster and it'll blast off the fuzzies. I haven't tested it, so I don't know. They just, I just found that on forums online and Drew mentioned it to me one meeting. I didn't know there was a handheld sandblaster. I'm just thinking of one, you know, like that knocks the paint right off of metal and it's stuff. It's the same concept. All it is is it's a sandblaster. You know, normally it comes in a big tank and you put your your stuff in the tank. Yep. No, this is, it just attaches to the end of the air hose and it has a pod that you put your medium in, whether it's be a porcelain or actual sand or whatever. I mean, I always call it a sandblaster. Um, but you put it in and it just, it just blast it out of the hose and then you either just do it over a bucket or a, a giant tub or something. And it collects all your medium. You dump it back in your bag and use it again. Okay. Hmm. I'll have to look into that. But I don't have a large air compressor by any means. So I'm kind of like, that isn't an option for me right now. I'm looking to, as I, you know, build more space in my garage and maximize use, it'll be something in the future. I just don't have it at this time to test it. Yeah. I don't have a big air compressor either. I've got a little single car garage. So, I mean, yeah, this, this I, machine takes up about a quarter of my, my wall space. No, hundred percent. Like it takes up <laughs> the entire outside space in my garage. I have it against the door that I will outside and put fans on it as it runs. So it keeps the dust out of the garage. Yeah. Justin, would you be willing to show your, uh, that loom you're working on or any concepts of it? Um, I posted the, the handle that I've been working on in carbide create uh, in the Facebook group on oh, August cool. 15th. Um, okay. the, the handle is probably about 30% too small because I didn't realize carbide create didn't scale things properly when I loaded it in. Right. Uh, so I've got to redo it. Um, that was last weekend that I was working on it, I think. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try to get new versions out this weekend if I can. Dustin, um, if, if you get a chance, I'd love to, to chat with you because I'm not a lot of us are working with Carbide Create. If you wanted to like add me on Facebook or anything like that, I would love to like actually work with you to see 
how you're creating it in Photoshop or an Illustrator versus how I'm doing it. Yeah. Um, um, can I share my screen? I can mm -hmm. show you. I've got Carbide Create up right now. I was actually going to ask if you two would be interested in doing a either or both of you together next week. Just a quick, very quick 10 minute tutorial on Carbide Create on here. I mean, it's too easy. I'll actually be here, still here next week, so it'll be great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll be at my home office still. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm not a, I'm not an expert. <laughs> I'm not, that's okay. It's, We're not looking seven for days in. <laughs> We're, Everything We're I've done for... at this point is entirely experimental. Like yep. I've looked at the help pages, but the help pages are not that great. Um, combing through forums to see what works. And a lot of this is just like, okay, that doesn't work as well as I wanted it to. Let me try it this way that I kind of have an idea that might work. Yeah, no, not a problem. Um, Dustin, I'm making you the host so that you can share your screen. Okay. So let's see. Well, let's just pull up. Let me see if this works. Are you seeing Carbide Create now? Yep. Yep. Okay. So this is um, kind of the prototyping I'm, I'm doing right now. I'm doing some handles with the gear attached to it and then some. Um, clasps that will lock into those gears itself and so this is my simulation of of how i'm designing it so you That's can amazing. see sorry go ahead no it's just amazing it's really cool uh i've actually cut um the handles and the gears separately using laser cutters in the past and these clasps as well um we can go back you can actually see it my Yep. My cut paths here. And you can see over here, I've, like I said, I got my quarter bit um, set up right here and then my 16th inch bit separately. So you can see I'm just, my, my 16th inch bit is just going around and cleaning up the teeth itself on yeah. the gears. And then once around as well on these clasps to make sure that that, that little hook um, right up here gets cleaned out to match Mm -hmm. that that gear as well can you so can you go back to your design on the top uh, left to hit your design oh yeah so that's what you have can yep. you go to the transform button uh let's see which one yeah that, that one the first one is the move or move, the, first one's the, move the second was the transform scale yeah yeah so and yeah so, so you can see there yep and this I don't know is, what you put it put into. And this is actually the problem I, I discovered is when I loaded this in, um, instead of being the size I want right here, it came in too small. And I had to res I had to change this. I think it came in at like three inches instead of 3.74. Okay. So one of the things I ran into into SketchUp. Um, or not SketchUp. Well, yeah, SketchUp and Inkscape. Did you have any stroke on your lines? Yes, I did. I don't know how big of a stroke. So that stroke, if it's anything at all, it doesn't recognize it. And in easel or in uh, in uh, carbide create, and so mm -hmm. it'll throw off your design. So I was at one point creating circles. I was trying to do seventeen inch circles, um, and I didn't realize that I had an eighth inch stroke on my lines. Um, and it kept coming back to 16 and three quarter. And I mean, I was okay with that. And then I, you know, I just kept it as is because it worked great, but I couldn't figure out why it wasn't matching up. It's because that eighth inch stroke, uh, is non-existent to the program. I don't know how Inkscape works. Um, I, I've only looked at it a couple of times. Illustrator looks at the actual shape instead. Uh, let me see if I can change this. Nope. Let me see. Let me switch over to screen instead of application. That should let me switch over, I believe. Yeah. Um, so here's my design in uh -huh. Illustrator. And even though I've got a stroke on this, it's not very thick to begin with. And then um, I don't know if you can Can you pull this. it? Can you go to the transform button on those just so we can see what it actually says it is? Yeah, it says right here, um, 2.7998 is the height so it's about three inches basically okay i just um, oh there and, i'm sorry i'm I had the, something over the side of it. i'm sorry okay, okay so yeah it's, it's on the far right hand side it's 
or I guess it's uh, almost 2.8 inches tall, I yeah. should say. Um, but it doesn't count the width of the stroke. Okay. So let me move this. If I was to go in here and increase this stroke, you know, it's nice and thick. Say, it doesn't change the, doesn't change the dimensions. Okay. And then sketch or an Inkscape, it definitely does. Um, so that was, uh, it's interesting. So when you transform, if you were to put that into Carbide Create right there, it wouldn't be the exact same. No. So the way I found out is actually this is this is supposed to fit a dowel, a one uh -huh. and a quarter inch dowel. And when I cut it out, it came out to be an inch instead of an inch and a quarter. And I'm so like, you got an inch and a quarter there. Can you can you upload just one of those and create a new file and carve yeah, it? See what it does. Hang on one second. Let me double check this. Uh, let's see. Today is what the nineteenth. Save it real fast. Oh, hang on. <laughs> um, I don't know about anybody else. I've got a, a network attached storage on my home system uh, yeah. saving, and it's got to spin up and, and wake up here real fast. There we go. Uh, where did I save that? Hang on one, one second. Let me see where I saved. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've done yeah. this. <laughs> okay. Wrong folder. I did it real fast here. There we go. So if I click on this scale, you can see it's actually uh, 0.9333. Instead of an inch and a quarter, yeah. Instead of an inch and a quarter, yeah. And so if I do the whole thing, scale it it is 2.099 instead of, of an inch yeah so i mean it's okay for me to just go in here and say i want this to be uh what was that 2.799 or something like that yeah. and apply it and it scales it up and that's fine i was just curious how can i am i doing something wrong in the saving in illustrator and i've tried multiple different ways of saving an svg uh, several different properties, like a 1.0 or a 1.1 or something like that. But I get this every single time I'm, I import into Carbide. I've not noticed that at all in Inkscape like that. Mine come out almost exact. Okay. I uh, might try saving out of Illustrator, open up in Inkscape and save it out of Inkscape to see what happens. Hold on. I don't know. Anyway, I was just curious. I didn't mean to take up a lot of time on this. I was... No, I'm, I'm interested to see how you did it because I, I saw those handles and uh, I almost sent you a message. I was still at work at the time and I was like, that's pretty, pretty cool. Because uh, I saw you, I think you did it out of a uh, particle board. Uh, no, it's uh, Red Oak. That's right. Red Oak, that's right, Red Oak. And it, it, clean, it cut very cleanly. Yes. Um, obviously, there was still a little bit of fuzzies. I was curious, can you show me that 16th inch bit? I didn't know. I, I really wanted to see that more than anything. It's, I, I don't have it with me. Um, it's in a mana. 16th inch um, oh. bit. Let me see Good if list. don't have the purchase order with me here. I'm, sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna look it up online. Um, but I can I can put that in the uh, chat. I can look up the number. Okay, yeah. I'm I gotta not say, played with uh, a bit that small. How fast was your? Uh, can you go to carbide? Can you go to your tool paths? And uh, I, the original and show me that that feed and speed and how you put it in there. Does that even matter? Uh, I'm concerned. I almost bought a 16th inch. I wasn't sure which one you were running. I was concerned about the brittle or how easily it was going to break. Um, so I was curious how you had input your actual um, the feed and speeds of your bit on for the cut the the cut path. Let's see. Is it it's this one? There we go. So I, it, I didn't even worry about the the bit speed. You Is just some... chose a sixteenth inch bit. Yes. So this is what I set up as. Okay, so there you, that's what I was looking at. So you you have it going at twenty inches per minute, mm -hmm. and a plunge rate of twelve with an R. Okay, obviously the RPM doesn't matter because we're not running a spindle, but yeah, and a depth pass. But that was the other thing. So your depth pass is only 0 0.03. So it's actually about a thirty second of an inch at a time. Yeah. Okay. 
and you can and see you didn't have I, any problems with it? It, it no no it cut out great that's awesome yeah i've got to i got to get one of those now because <laughs> <laughs> i i really you like make one of those now. You, yeah yeah the detail you had i was like hell yeah that's awesome but yeah um, patrick definitely get a 16th inch bit because okay that is um i got one of those that has the uh blue coating yeah, on top of spectra it. one of these bad boys i think it was only yeah it's a spectra I think it was only like five dollars more than an uncoated one. I think it was like. You all find that that coating really does. Like, are you I able had, to tell if it's helpful or? It looked brand new when I was finished, but I only did two of these handles, mm -hmm. and that's all I've done so far with it. Okay. So if you want, so. if you're willing to go back to bits, I'll show you. I got my whole bit layout here in front of me. Like I said, it's a it's a bad collection of uh, here, too much I'll money, but. I'll stop sharing um, so you can go back. No, uh, it's fine because they can. I think they can see my camera. They, yeah, but then you, it's bigger for them to see it. There we go. Uh, so as you can see, I have a problem. <laughs> uh, there's certain things that I would recommend across the board, and I'll show you. So if you haven't got one of these, Dustin, money, baby. No, I didn't know how the replaceable um, blade was useful or not. Uh it's not necessarily useful, but you can see the difference in what you're, I'm oh, sorry, I'm messing with my camera. Low. Yeah. Yeah. So one's a, one's a uh, white side, a man a bit. And the other one, sorry, the focus sucks on this camera. But yeah, it's money. The difference is the depth. When I hog like product out with this bit and it takes it all and it does it very well. Um, the only challenge you run into <laughs> is when you're calibrating the tip of this because it's only one side. So when you're locking it in, it's gotta be perfect. Cause the first time I did it, I cut a star and I was like, this star looks horrible. And it's because I was cutting a circle. I wasn't cutting a point uh, cause it was spinning outside the, inner, the, the exact center point. If that makes sense. I'm probably not using the right words. I apologize, but this was basically set too low. So it was cutting a circle instead of a center point. Um, but lesson learned there, but mm -hmm. Do I think uh, Maker Made would win from having a bit like this? No. Why? Because, I mean, we're at a very niche point in the market, if I'm going to be honest. Yeah. And most people are not going to invest in something like this. And this bit, I actually got it on sale. Like they, Tools Today was selling it super cheap. Uh, but I went back and was looking to get a second one similar, like a 90 degree version. And I was not about to drop $90 on this bit. I got it for like 40. So I was like, nah. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're going to be using a lot, Dustin, it's a great investment. And the replacement uh, pieces on it, I think, are 20 bucks a piece for a brand new blade for it. So it pays for itself over time. Um, with that in mind, what I would invest in now, this one's over the top, but it is a beautiful art piece of artwork. That's a half inch compression bit. And it mills extremely well, especially when we talk about Patrick, when you seed it all the way in or just almost all the way in. Yeah. And talk about hogging some wood out. It'll What's your like depth per pass on that guy? Uh, usually, uh, if I, I tried one at a quarter inch and it hogged it. Uh, yeah. I haven't tried the latest one. I was telling him last week. Hey, baby girl. Uh, <laughs> yeah, your glasses. Uh, it's still an excellent bit, but you can actually buy them. And I think you'd be better off actually, because most of our market is running plywood, right? Now, this is a three mil, but where it really doesn't, it, this is over the top, it's an inch and a quarter cutting pass. And most of our people that are cutting are cutting um, three quarter inch plywood at most. Mm -hmm. So you could actually save some money and just make it a three quarter inch cutting uh, depth and works great. But where this make where you make your money is when you're pocketing. So it oh, really yeah. pockets out fast. So you're doing the pocket cuts, it does amazing. Um, so that's one. These, that's really so cool. he has the 16th. This is an eighth inch version, right? That's you should probably recognize that. Hey, Lauren. Yeah. Yep. Uh, how does that pocket real well? Does it have a point on it? Or, I mean, because that looks like a big bit to shove into a, a you know, an empty space or a, a solid wood, right? Yeah, but you got to realize, so if you're cutting out a pocket, like obviously a four inch pocketing ain't going to work, but if you're cutting a something that's, I don't have one in here, but if you're doing like a 16th inch, I think we already sold it, like a 16 inch circle where you're pocketing out letters on it. Yeah. And you've got large because it, I mean, you're talking about cutting it down to a, a third of the time, at least. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, it and, really cuts down, like I said, pocketing, not cutting out like a whole like internal piece. Okay. Not a contour piece, but an actual pocket. 
okay. where it does multiple passes back and forth to clean up. And you it find just, that 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 three flute one works well? Uh, honestly, I didn't see that much of a difference because we're not running at the speeds to maximize it. Okay. The reason why I got a three flute is it was on sale on Amazon for uh, 30 bucks. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry so, to interrupt. Yeah. No, no, no. I think that's, that's a good point. Uh, I didn't think of mentioning that. So it really doesn't, you know, do any major advantage. But like I said, the only thing is that a lot of them, as you see, like, look at this thing. Like, do I really need to cut that much material at one time? No, it's just, that's the shortest they made them. It just, it's overkill in my opinion. But they really are a half inch bit. If you wanted to get into a half inch bit, Pat, which is really good for uh, pocketing. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of users would actually buy that, especially if you made them cheaper. Um, and then I don't have, did you have, uh, Dustin, do you have the uh, quarter inch? I have mine currently in my router, so I don't have it able to pull it in here. Your quarter inch version of the Spectre bit? No, I just bought the 16th inch bit. I've got plenty of quarter inch from um, MakerMate. So yeah. I'm like, I, I don't need anything extra right now. So, and that's where I was like, you know, bang for the buck, right, Pat? Is that at the end of the day, this nice compression bit is great for us that are doing repeated cuts and tons of cuts. Right. Um, there you go. You're welcome. So, but at the end of the day, is your average customer going to use them that much? No, because you can see this is y'all's bit. Yeah. Right. Um, works like a champ. What I found though was after a full day of use, it started to wear down. Mm. Now I had the quarter inch version of this bit. This is another shorter eighth inch. Uh, it's a half inch cutting path. This one has cut, oh God, hours and hours of work. Like, I don't even know. I can show you my path on my on my computer, how many different projects it's cut, but it's a lot. And it's just now starting to wear down where I purchased another one to replace it. Um, but yeah. Now, the only thing I don't think y'all have, and I'd be excited to see where I think a lot of cost customers are going to use it, especially if you're looking to be the one-stop shop, is these mini, you can see how tiny that bearing is. Eighth inch bearing. That's mm -hmm. tiny. You can, and then really where you make your money is the mini flush cut. Why do you think bit. that? Is that an eighth inch or a sixteenth? It's an eighth inch, eighth inch flush trim bit, and you can see the tiny little bearing on it. Mm -hmm. Where that gets money is as you compare it, right? So if you're cutting with an eighth inch bit, it'll get right into that groove and clean up any of the any mistakes or any fuzzies. Or mm -hmm. normally you'd have to take a file to it, which is very frustrating because that's more and more mm -hmm. time. Um, or if you have your router table set up, that flush trim bit is a champ. Now, with that in mind, I also don't have it, but I have, this is a the obviously larger version, the half inch, which I don't think would be, be much money, but a yeah. half inch or a, or a quarter inch flush trim bit. I have it currently set in my router table right now. And all my projects, even last week I was showing um, some boards. Uh, I, oh yeah, you wouldn't hear last week. I ramped the speed up to 55 inches per minute. Just to oh, see what cool. it would do. Uh, and it works great. It does. It flies. It does a great wow. job. Uh, but what I found was uh, we were cutting circles, the 16 and three quarter inch circles. I cut them uh, at 50 to 55 inches per minute. And it would cut a 16 and a three quarter inch circle in about six minutes flat. Wow. Um, and I have some pictures that I'll show online, but it, it cut it very, very smooth. The do you have video was, of that? Uh, I do have a quick short clip on my phone um, yeah. that I'm looking to show. And I'm going to do more. Like I said, it's going to be one of the projects I run through because we cut a lot of circles. It's just a, I'd a love to see that. That would be a um, really potent exercise to see this, what it, how well it, it performs at 55 inches a minute. Yeah. So where you make your money is if you have a flush trim bit, and I know I have a lot of these, you set it and guess what? Any of your 10th of a millimeter difference is automatically gone with one pass because mm -hmm. this is just going to clean it up. Mm -hmm. Um, so I literally, the only challenge I ran into, and so I'll tell you two things that I see the machine doing is that, um, if you're cutting multiple cuts on a single sheet of plywood and you bump into an older cut, right? The, it's moving so fast that the chain stretches a little bit. So it'll have a little bulge to your cut until it cuts back into its path again. Mm -hmm. Um, 
that was actually, it was like frustrating because I thought I did something wrong. And then I realized, oh, it's because it's moving so fast. It's doing something funky. Right. Um, but my desktop sander cleaned it up. It took about 15 to 20 seconds per bolt yeah. of just tidying it back up. Now, right. that wasn't the problem. What I'm concerned about now, and it fixes itself. At first, I was freaked out. And I was like, oh, I've done something wrong. So you got your square. I'm kind of like making it small here. So you got your square sheet goods. Or I'll show it on something like this. So your sheet good. So let's say this is your entire stock, your four by eight sheet of stock, obviously not to dimension. And I'm here at the center. I'm moving over here. What it would do is it would actually move down till it got here and then pop it back up. It was a weird, I need to show a video. I have a video on my phone. It was literally, and it would do it to the center. And then when I come back up, it would literally move up when it got to the edge and then pop it back down when it got to home. It would literally, I was like, oh, it's gonna miss home every time. It would correct itself at the very end and get back to home. Huh. But when I say it moves across that stock, it moves across that stock. That's weird. Um, it's doing, and I'll have to show the video, literally every time it would go either up or down or low. And right before it got to the end, it would pop it back up to home. Because I was worried that my all my calibration was off. Because yeah. you clearly see it's not moving straight across the board. Right. Um, now Crazy. up and down, like I said, it flies. It really does move. Cool. Um, yeah, I'd love to see that video of it. And, uh, um, I even timed it out to make sure that like the software wasn't right. It, like, it moves. Um, I'm very happy with how fast it cuts. The only thing is, is if you, if you bump into a previous cut or you go outside the edge of your cut, it will, the chain will flex. Yeah. Um, and it was one of those things that I was talking to my dad as he's done this kind of, you know, mess with a lot of different chains and things like that. I was debating actually upgrading my chain and sprockets. See if I could bomb on them and, and see what would happen if I, increase the size of the chain would it reduce that flex mm -hmm. um just to see how fast i could ramp it up because obviously just for my the curiosity i mean wants to see can i go at 70 inches per minute what'll happen I mean, if at I a certain point it? you're going to start introducing sway to it right oh, 100%. So especially when it goes lateral now vertically that's a different story right that's why it accelerates in the verticals well no i mean it was going left and right fast it yeah. really was Oh, I believe um, it'll do it. I'm just curious to see like what kind of pendulum action you would get at a certain point, right? And how much can you offset that with added weight potentially? Well, see, well, that was the other thing, right? So we were, I was doing the math because we were comparing the motors. The motors have tons of strength mm -hmm. and I've already over, I already oversized the screws holding the mounts and the motors into my two by four. So that I'm not concerned about the strength there. I was concerned about, well, the motors can hold, you know, I think they're what, 500 some pounds a piece in strength. So uh, the chains, yeah, they hold over 500 pounds. And then the, the motor, what's the, mo what's the motor uh, strength? Uh, it's a lot, way too much. <laughs> right. I don't remember. And that's what I'm saying. Like it can, it can really ramp it. So as I increase the chains, naturally, I'm going to increase the weight on my sled. Can I push the weight to 40 pounds? Maybe 45 pounds. Will it do it? At this point, it's the curiosity saying, hey, I'm in between projects right now. I have time. Let's see what it does. Ooh without trying to snap my machine in half um and all those are down the road but i i can confidently tell you it'll cut a circle um and i, I should probably bring i have one, a few of them still in the shop but it'll cut a circle at 55 inches per minute with and in, in a, just about six minutes flat yeah i'd be um, curious on a square um but that's really good to know that's really cool well, so, i'd love to see more experimentation on that um just just to, just to jump in i've got a i've got a 12 30 here i got a bounce yeah. to in a sec so i just want to make sure that we're we're not gonna so this was cut at 55 at 50 inches per minute that was wow this was cut at 50 inches per minute this is not Man, a that's amazing shape. yeah yeah uh yeah all i did was take us the sanding brush to it and clean up any of the fuzzies and you can see like i mean i'll try to get it close to the camera like it's Obviously, it's plywood, so you get to a point mm -hmm. sometimes that'll fray, but that's not due to the machine. But yeah, gotcha. Cool. That's awesome. So, and this is dimensional. I measured it out. It's it's within um, a thirty second of an inch to the actual measurement put in, which yeah. is more than enough. I mean, I tell you, none of the people I'm giving this to notices it's a thirty second. They're never gonna know a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they did their robot. So it'll do it. I will say it'll do it. Um, obviously I was telling last week, so you get down to these points, right? It would fly up to the points and about a quarter inch from the point, it would slow way down, wrap around the point and then take off again. So the software is working and like, we know we discussed it. Okay. That's works. really cool. That's really good um, to know. It definitely slows down and then 
And then as soon as it makes that turn, it takes off again. Well, I'm going to go make some projects today at 55 inches. Now you obviously have to go into the settings and, and release that level, um, mm -hmm. but it'll do it. The weird thing I'd, I'd like your input is see if, see if yours does the same thing where it goes down at an angle yeah. and pops back up to the home. Yeah, I absolutely. Um, will. But that's also where the controller, I'd like to play with the controller and see what the controller does when I hold the left joystick. Does it jog across and then come back up or would it, you know, stay flat? Um, where you see your times is that you're, you're cutting way less air, if that makes sense, as you're moving from point to point. Mm -hmm. um, gotcha. So, I don't know, it's just interesting tri interesting trials. I've got quite a few uh, projects I've got to do over the next few days now that kind of settling down with the baby, but yeah, you can kind of see her back there. She's mm -hmm. behind me now. <laughs> oh, there but, she is, cutie. Yeah. Matt, I haven't pushed mine that far either, but I'm going to go try it out here in just a second and see what I get. I've got a single line. Um, it's like a it's like a single line drawing that I want to use the the V bit for and see how it looks. So I'm going to spray paint a sheet of um, two by four foot or four by four foot ply and try a big project on it. Um, yeah. But, last, oh, last name. I was looking yeah. for this bit. So this is the quarter inch. I realized I had a hidden. You can see the difference. This one's probably cut comfortably 50 to 75 in, or 75 circles with multiple, multiple cuts mm -hmm. on like Spartan heads and all kinds of stuff. And you can see it has worn down. You can see the hue is gone. It is still as sharp as a standard steel bit or a carbide bit with mm -hmm. that coating. Now, is it as sharp as one of the others that hasn't been abused? No, because these things are razor sharp. Like go cut your finger. Yeah, yeah, um, for sure. But uh, at the end of the day, unfortunately, I just don't think many of your customers is going to get the use out of something like this. But right. you can see, I'll show you, this is one of y'all's bits. And after too much use, it did do that. I just ran it back to back to back to back, and you can see the bluing on it. Mm -hmm. I know that's not very sharp, but yeah. Yeah. It just wore down. Yeah, you got some bit scorch there, too. Have you thought about yeah. slowing down your RPMs? So I did both. It's just over and over and over use, uh, back to back to back. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the constant even use. slowing yeah. it down, what you really come into is I'm running a lot of birch plywood and MDF, and it's just so dense that it just, if I was running regular pine and things like that, probably not so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. But okay. like I said, it, it really comes down to, if you're only doing a project, you know, once an hour or, you know, once a day or something, you're doing a project here and there, and it's not that much, then you're not going to need that. But if you're running like I am, where you're doing, you're working for four or five hours straight every other day, like the machine is running, yeah, it's just going to, it's going to take its toll. On yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Well, that's really, really, really useful information, Lauren. I really appreciate it. Um, I yeah. I mean, the, the other option that you might propose is see if you could partner with a company like Tools Today. We've got um, a manufacturer who can do all of those things. We can do the coatings and everything. So what we need to figure out is, I don't think the coating costs very much. It's not a huge cost to add. So honestly, if we can add it to all of our bits, I might just do that. Yeah, you all are saying it's a value, but we were told previously that it's not particularly useful. But it, if it's keeping bits strong for longer, then you know, and we could even potentially sub out the fact that we currently use a hundred percent tungsten carbide for a carbide coated bit, and then do that nano coating on top, and then um, you know, probably get the same price overall per bit, and not have to change the price to the customer. So that would be a win. A hundred percent. I do, I, I do stick by my guns that if you really wanted to get into it, the only thing that's missing is one of these. Even if it was just this one, none of the roundovers, none of that. Huh? Just this one or a, a flush trim bit. Like y'all really went into a flush, like got a couple yeah. of them because every project, even when I jacked it up, right? Using the flush trim bit, it brings everything back to home. So even when I did something wrong or I've even like let the router tip, You've ever done that, right? You got to the edge. You forgot you didn't put a safety, uh, you didn't put a skirt on there. This cleans it right back up. And then just a little bit of sanding, you would never know you made a mistake. So Lauren, cool. just to just to be clear, you're using that in your router that you've already cut out a piece with. You're not, it's not using that that flush trim bit in a router table separately afterward, right? Yeah, no. So basically, especially if you use it, so this is the money where it's at, right? Right. Because the way it's designed is we all buy a separate router right? Yeah. 
my idea for the company is you take um, and put in, so say you have a rigid router. I have a rigid, or a, yeah, so I have a rigid. So I, have, I know a lot of people have different ones. What are you doing with your base right now, right? Your base isn't being used for anything. It's just outside, it's just sitting on the table somewhere. Yeah. So you use the machine to say, hey, cut this out. It's now a table or a, a to match your router, drop your router in. As soon as you're done with your cut, you take the router out of your M2, pop this bit in that you would normally do anyway, pop it into your base and go to okay. town and clean up your cut. So you're not you're not putting that in the M2 because I, I just can no, see no, 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 sorts no, no. of problems. All right, all right, all right. No, 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 no. Not I'm not I'm not running with a machine. Yeah. But my the concept is is that you can literally take because my base is just sitting on my work table right now. Sure, sure. I'm not doing anything with it. Yep. And for me to to turn that base into a router table is super easy, right? Yep. Um, and it just maximizes use of your machine. Hey, Lauren, I made you the host because I got to bounce. I got a 1230. I got to hop over to. So, okay. So I'll talk to you all soon. You guys stay on here as long as you want. All right. I appreciate, I appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, but. I don't, I don't know if anybody else has it. I don't want to take up y'all's time if y'all got a lot of things to do. Dustin, I'd love to also, you know, if you got time to, to mess with Carbide Create, but. Um, hey, yeah. Lauren. Uh, so uh, it, what what a brand is that bit from? Is it from Amana Tool? It is. So if you okay. go to, yeah. I buy from Tools Today, is that the only place I could find these mini roundovers? Um, like I said, I just, the, the cleanup is what takes most of my time. And these okay. have completely taken that away because all those tabs come off, especially when you're doing little tiny eighth inch cuts. Now, obviously, 16th inch is, is a little different. I know Dustin, I, I would love to, I don't know if there's a way we find another router, but if you found one better for cleaning these up, but um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the frame is, since I, I did that handle and it was the wrong size, I didn't even bother worrying about the cleanup but that's something I need to figure out at some point in time as well. So well, see, the other thing is they also make, and I'll show you, it's a tiny little roundover bit. So some of the fraying too also goes away. Like if you like that flush trim will clean up the sides, but you can completely get rid of the fraying in one pass with a, a roundover or a chamfer bit. And yeah. they both, they make all three of them. It's worth the investment. I think somebody like you, Dustin, would, would greatly uh, appreciate that investment of, this it's a three bit combo for like I want to say like a hundred bucks, but it's worth it. They last a long time. This is this is a workflow I'm not even familiar with though. I've I've just been cutting it on the on the on the M2 and then taking it off and sanding the crap out of it. So uh, yeah. I hate that part. I hate that part. That's yeah. why I recruited my wife to do the sanding. <laughs> no, uh, but I, I didn't that. even I didn't even think about putting uh you know these bearing ones in there. That's a good idea. So thanks. Um not with that in mind, I mean you can I can't stress this enough. Compare the size here. Yeah. Yeah. But so do they know. make do they make one that's sixteenth of an inch? Not that I've seen. Okay. Um, that's what I'm saying. I think if we were going to get into a sixteenth of an inch, and I think if they have a manufacturer that's already doing it, if you're a mesh with a Dremel tool uh, router bits, I've I have a Dremel. Yeah. So you ever seen their router bits, their flush trim router bits they have? No, no I have not. So they're, they're a bearingless for flush trim. So the tip, it literally looks like this. I know it's tiny, right? It looks like tip this, but at the tip of it's just smooth. Okay. Um, I have not really tried them much. I've messed around with them uh, with some cheap ones. Now I've used my, my Dremel before I got a lot nicer tools. So, I, you know, lost them and broke them. Mm -hmm. But um. I think a 16th inch, that would be our best bet is to make a flush. It's literally just the tip of this is just a round, perfectly round head to where it can't cut against it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But it would get into those corners where you needed them to. So is the rest of the bit then um, just a straight flute or is it a spiral? They make them both ways. Okay. I'll have to look that up. Um, uh, I, by the way, I put the, um, the bit number in the chat of the 16th inch bit I picked up from a mana. It's that four six zero zero nine dash K. Yeah, because I was just on. Did you did you buy that through Tools Today or straight from Amana? Tools Today. I, I looked it up on the Amana website, and then I don't think you actually buy from them. I think you have to go yeah. somewhere else. And I ended yeah. up at Tools Today. Most of my stuff I buy through Tools Today. Hey, oh, yeah, hey guys, I uh, I really like your idea of doing a a demo on on 
carbide create because I haven't used that one as much. I've only exclusively used uh, 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 easel. And then I did, I have found this F, F engrave for, um, for doing V-bit stuff, but, but uh, I'd really be interested in your carbide create, you know, just walking me through, you know, or at least you walking through a project and just showing how to do it from start to finish. And I think that'd be good because I'm interested in trying other things as well. And I've noticed a lot of limitations obviously with, with easel as well. So th that's a really good idea. And I'd, I'd really be interested in something like that too. So. So the thing about easel that frustrated me and I found much better in carbide create is the fact that um, I can actually take each individual path even if it's the same bit that I'm using yeah. and adjust the speed and the depth of the cut if I wanted to. Oh, okay. So if I felt like there was a portion of my project that I'm cutting um, and it was like, I'm cutting it a little bit too fast in that one area, I can actually select that path and slow yeah. it down individually. Oh, okay. Wow. So I was going to get, if y'all you, got time, I'll, I'll, I'll share my screen and I was going to show you. Oh, well, not, not today. I, I got a, I got a meeting I got to get to as well, but I'm, I'm just so glued to this because this is all good information. So thank you for everything. And thanks for showing me all your, all your bits. I, uh, I made a box for, I'm, I'm working on a computer at nice. work, and I made a, I made an enclosure because they basically specified the size of the box, uh -huh. you know, and, and so I needed to visualize that. So I made one just the other day and made it with finger joints and you know, just just to to get the idea of of what you know how that how big that is, you know. And I put handles in it and and put you know holes in it for for cables and stuff for like network stuff. But just to figure out you know how to get all this done on an easel was pretty easy for me. But it still took a while. But I'd be interested in carbide create too, and you know, trying to figure figure out you, a different program and stuff. Can you zoom in on those box cuts? What's that? Can you zoom in on those box cuts? Yeah. No. Just to see. I put dog bones on them. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, the, the, some of them weren't great. I this was a this was actually like a half sheet of plywood. This is four by eight. Um, when I cut it all out, I had to. I don't like the way that the easel aligns the box or whatever because it it wasn't it wasn't good for the um, for the half sheet of plywood I did. So I had to drag all of them around. But some of the some of the box joints didn't fit real great, so I had to do a little extra sanding and stuff. But it it got the job done. So I just need. No, I, I, I think it looks it. amazing, man. I think I really do. Like at the end of the day, like we're all trial and error, and I mean, yeah. the fun part will be dialing in how tight of a tolerance you can get those box cuts, because yep. um, I don't know, uh, Dustin, if you mess with it, you can play with the offset quite a bit. Um, and carbide create and that's how i i fix some of my um actual cutting variances is playing with that offset i'd yeah. be curious um yeah. how well, tight I you can make those tolerances until until today i thought i was living on the edge by dialing it up to 32 inches per minute i thought oh <laughs> i better i better slow down man i'm gonna break the speed barrier i didn't know you could do 55 i mean of course i i would wouldn't go that high but this took two hours to cut out right so I, I'm, you know, but I push my, um, I've got a quarter or a half, an eighth inch uh, compression bit that I cut this out on yeah. and, and I push it, I push it an eighth inch each cut. I, I go down a whole eighth yeah. inch each cut because that sucker can just go. And I slowed it down a lot on my, my, I got a, I got a skill um, router and it shows me digitally like how fast the route, the spindle's going. And so I was experimenting with is cutting as slow as possible, but I, I was just bored sitting there for two hours. So I'm going to dial it up now and, you know, try maybe 40 or something, you know, I'm so just worried I, about accuracy. Yours is accurate at that speed. So, yeah, I've not had any uh, major issues. Now I've not cut anything like extremely intricate. Uh -huh. uh, so those box cuts would be, those finger cuts would be interesting to see. Yeah. Um, but like I said, it slowed down on them. I would, I think it would work. The, the, I mean, all we can do is try. Now, obviously, you know, to get to those inches per minute over 40, you have to go into the settings on the left yep. and you have to raise the, the limits on it. What limits? What are you talking about? 
So can somebody, I don't have uh, Megaverse on this computer. Can y'all, does anybody have Megaverse pulled up? They can uh, pull it up. I can do it, yep. I can pull it up. Uh, let's see if I can make you the host, Matt. Okay. While you're while you're doing that, out of curiosity, um, making those tabs for that box yep. was that uh, one of those add-ins for Easel, or is that something you did manually? No, Easel has a little program in the in the yep. in the lower corner, and you can just say, "I want a box this big," and it it lays it out and it automatically makes the finger joints, and then you say, "Yeah, I want dog bones," because the dog bones, if you don't put dog bones in, those finger joints aren't going to fit. Right? No, they yeah. Won't. It'll, yeah. The corner will be rounded. <laughs> yep. Right. You have to chisel each one. Won't yeah, you? <laughs> and I'm not. I'm not going to do that. There's hundreds of them there. So yeah. Let me, let me so you say that screen. though. Uh, my I did buy this little uh, sanding kit because uh, I don't like chiseling. Yeah. Um, you can buy it's a little bitty tiny husky sanding kit. Okay. That will cut. That will cut it perfectly smooth. And I've tested it. Now I've not done one that big, obviously. Okay. And it just takes a few pass with the. It's just a square sanding uh, file. Yeah. That a few passes, it'll square it up. So if you ever wanted to go for perfect and okay. you really want to waste an hour of your life, okay, um, <laughs> just to see if you can, it will do it. Well, I'm, I'm just, you just blew my mind with that flush trim uh, workflow. I, I've never even thought about putting, you know, a separate router just to clean up the edges that, I mean, that just, or a separate, you know, a separate step to do that. I've always sanded them. So well, what, next what week, limits I'll, you, what yeah, limits next are you talking week, about? I'd love to, if, if he'll let us next week, we just take turns showing off our work area. Cause yeah. I, I'm very much like my own kind of train of thought, but if you go into the, go ahead and open it all up. Okay. I, I can't, I'm not connected to the machine yet, so I can't open it, but. Okay. So usually when you go down here on the left side of your Maslow or the console. Yeah. And you open it all up, you'll go down and it has a max speed rate towards oh, the bottom that? and all you, okay. it's in millimeters, right? So just yep. do your math. I can't remember what it is because uh, I upped mine to 60, I think it was. Maybe yeah, it, there's a whole section that has settings and it will list you all the different options. They're basically the defaults of your uh, your M2. Yeah, that's where I you can like 15, 15 or fifteen twenty five. That's just over 60 millimeters per minute. Wow. Okay. It's in this uh -huh. section, though, in this console area, huh? Yeah. OK, my I my car is in the way of the of the the m2 right now so i can't even go over there if i wanted to so i'm sorry no no so let's see i find it interesting so you run your console from inside you there might have lost him because i i run two separate computers yeah so do i um and i either jump it via wi-fi through google drive I don't have a, a great external. I was doing a local area network to a hard drive and I was running into the network issues with my internet service provider. Um, so I may have to, I may have to bug you about that, Dustin, because it seems like you've got it worked out. Well, um, I have a, I have a laptop and it's basically the only thing I use it for is the M2 now. Well, see, that's what I did. I used a 12 year old laptop, put it in the garage, put it on a, a stand that I built. And then, but what I do is I build the G code on my, and my much stronger computer um, with Inkscape and then jump, drop it into my Google Drive and then pull it from my Google Drive in the garage. Yeah, that's pretty much what I do too. I just, there's no way I'm taking this $1,200 computer and put it in a garage. To get I, I have a desktop. It doesn't, it doesn't literally go out to the garage. So <laughs> no, no, same here. That's what I'm on now. Like I'm not taking that chance. Like this is a, a high level gaming computer that I'm like, I like it for everything else too. And I'm not about to put it in that dusty environment. Yeah. I got an old uh, laptop from my work. And uh, so I just use that as my M2 uh, laptop. Yep. It just basically runs Makerverse. I don't have, I don't have Illustrator or I think I did oh, put yeah. Carbide on there just so that I can pull something up if I needed to. But that's yeah, I didn't even basically do Carbide on it. I just walk around the corner into my house in my office area and do it um but yeah now that's yeah i'm super excited to work with you on carbide create because I, I actually took the time especially on my v bits to upload uh, a new user profile and build the v bits based upon feeds and speeds and information from a mana tool online i saw that you can do that i, I thought i saw someplace that you can actually upload the mana tool library automatically you, through you a can, but i think it's in the pro version 
I haven't been oh, able to figure it out okay. in, the, in the free version. Okay. Yeah, um, I haven't done that yet. So I just so, I've just been using the defaults that are in there for the shape of go. Yeah. So I did the, the exact those. same thing. Um, and then, but the the advantage you have when you take the time to build your own bits is when you load them, they automatically load those specs. So my V bit, um, it auto had automatically has all the exact same step downs that I want. Like I have it set to when I load that bit. All those settings are already pre-done, so it makes as you're bu building more files, it, it's ready to go. It's just a lot faster as you build multiple files. Okay. Yeah. I, again, I'm seven days into Carbide, so. No, 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 hundred <laughs> percent. That's what. That, but that's the thing is, like, you, you, there's a good chance you notice things that I didn't, um, and I'd, and I'd love to work with you to see, you know, where we can go with it because I think, uh, always two heads are better than one, right? So. Yeah. Um, so. Another question, and this will be something I'm going to bring up next week as well, is that I'm thinking of cutting into my wasteboard to create um, holes that I can put threaded um, inserts into from the back. And then I could set up, um, I, I don't even know how to explain it, just little strips of wood that would support boards. Because what I'm doing is I'm cutting, I'm going to be cutting a lot of hardwood, not plywood. Yep. So I want to set up multiple boards. So if they're, you know, six or eight foot or six or eight inch wide by six or eight feet long, you know, I can stack multiples up on my, my wasteboard and I can actually put them in the exact same place every single time. So I, I agree with you. This is, I almost did that myself. I went a little bit different route and I'll explain myself because I think you're, you're doing the right thing, but I'll explain why I went a different way. So if I take you out to my shop, I would show you that I have a foam backer over my wasteboard. Uh, it's not that I'm concerned about my wasteboard because my wasteboard, I have nails and screw holes and all kinds of stuff in it where it has saved me is on my bits. Um, Cause you think how often you're drilling, you're going all the way through your board. Every time you dig, like it's one less uh, pass, especially as you're cutting through the board of it, not like having to cut through your waste board as it's cutting your actual piece. It's just cutting through that foam. Not to mention foam is about 12 bucks for a giant four by eight sheet. Right. Uh, now, what I do do is I basically take a piece of waste board and I have it for all my wood is I have all these stacks of waste board where I cut the boards are what two foot long by two foot tall right and it's just it looks like half of a graph is all it is um and what i do is i drop that in with a level with uh some um trim nails trim nailer that i have and then all i do is i drop the pieces in as i'm cutting them and it automatically knows where home is at or very close to does that make sense what i'm saying i don't know if that makes any sense how i said it yeah, a little bit. I, I think I understand what you're saying. You're you're talking about like the two axes of a graph, a bar, yeah. a graph, yeah, so, X, Y axis. So, yeah. yeah, all I did was have it sitting there, and it, and it's, um, it's made from scrap wood of the same thickness that I've planed down for my wood, or for the same plywood, and then I just drop the next piece into place mm -hmm. and use a piece of uh, frog tape. I don't know if you've dealt with frog tape much. Yeah. Um, and do piece of frog tape. And I know like people have said like, oh, the thickness is going to affect it. I've seen zero, like almost zero effect of that thickness of that tape. It is just so thin. And I mean, it comes down to, I've measured it. It's less than a 10th of a millimeter thick. Uh, it's very thin. Um, and just taping it in place has held perfectly. And then just go to town with a cut. But it, it works for me. Um, so do you I'm use the frog? tape on the board that you're cutting yeah so i use it to hold the edge of the board so if i have my uh let's see if i can use an example here so say that the corner of this was cut out right so this is my this is my holder and say mm -hmm. this corner is cut out right this is gone this would just sit into that corner right here just like so and yeah. then i would run frog tape down this edge and across this just a couple of strips real quick and flatten them out and that holds it in place so that i can cut this out so you don't even have to worry about like drilling that board in or yeah um, so that's what i'm saying this just pops it. on and off and i grab a new quick strip of frog tape drop the next one in okay 
So it just keeps setting in that same slot. So it just happens over and over again. Drop the next one in, drop in a couple pieces of frog tape, hit play again. Yep. Okay. But I may have to try that. That's my little method. And I had and I put it online on the Facebook page and I got a lot of feedback like, oh, that don't work. It's gonna throw off the dimensions of your cut. And I've done it over and over and over again and not had a problem. So I mean, I encourage you to take a micrometer to like masking tape or frog tape. It's so thin. Right. It doesn't even register on most micrometers. I mean, if you if you needed to, you just lower another tenth of a millimeter in the cut. It's not gonna right. I'm not concerned about that. I was more thinking it wouldn't hold the material. Oh, no, it does. Because I literally, like, a lot of people have full skirts, right? And mm -hmm. they're talking about, like, all these things, but they're only cutting three-quarter inch plywood. They're only cutting half-inch plywood, right? Well, I'm cutting all kinds of stuff. Half-inch, three-quarter, eighth-inch, uh, one-inch uh, pine, like, you name it, right? Everything goes on the machine. So all I do is I take a scrap piece, um, and so say I'm just cutting this, right? So this is all that I have on my wood, right? Or on my board. Yep. I'll drop in uh, tiny little print or tiny little trim nails in each corner that I'm gonna trim off after I'm done cutting this piece. Or I'll just fill them in either one, right? Either way works. Um, then all I do is I take a second sheet of wood or scrap wood, put it on whatever side I'm having. And I've done this with the larger sheets and just put some frog tape holding it up. And this piece of wood will entirely be held up with frog tape without a problem. Okay, that I've I'm never had have to check that out. Oh, uh, yeah, that's my biggest concern is like it. Well, and my other my other issue I've noticed is with hardwood, it does sometimes have a bow in the boards. Does yes, the frog so, tape keep that down? So I'll be honest with you, I've not dealt with any bowing because uh, one of the things that I initially invested was a planer. Um, because I don't have a joiner, but uh -huh. have you have, do you have a planer in your shop? No, uh, I have, I've actually got a call out on a Facebook um, marketplace guy for maybe this weekend to pick one up, a used one. So how much, how much money you got to invest? Well, I mean, I know I'm getting personal here, so you feel free to tell me to, to no, I ain't answering that question, but. I mean, I can, uh, I could invest a couple hundred dollars, but I, right now I'm trying to, again, I don't have a very large area, so I just want to get something no, small no, no, that I can actually work with. So where, where are you located at? Uh, in Kansas City. So have you ever heard of a company called uh, Direct Tools? Uh, no. So they, they basically sell all TTI products. So Rigid, Ryobi, and, and Milwaukee, right? Mm -hmm. um, the reason why I bring this up is my planer, I got a full, the 13-inch rigid planer, right? I got it for 200 bucks, brand new, with warranty. Hmm. Okay. The reason being is uh, what they do is they basically uh, take anything that has like a like mine had a damaged uh box but then they sell it dirt cheap oh i see what you're saying okay so it's and literally so there's two things they'll sell you a factory refurbished which they're going to knock it's usually knocked off about 65 to 70 percent or they'll do a, a uh factory blemished and if you look it up you can search discount i think it's hang on a second let me go, make sure i'm telling you the right company. is it direct like, tools i was kind of looking that up real fast I think it's direct tools, direct tools, factory outlet. Yep. Okay. Um, so I've got one 20 minutes down the road from me here in Georgia and I, I've gotten so many tools at pennies on the dollar, my desktop sander, you know, the big rigid, rigid desktop sander mm -hmm. the one that sells for like two seventy five. Yep. Um, I got it for a hundred bucks. Okay. The big well. spindle sander. Um, Cause there's no way I'm in the same boat. Like I don't waste money. I don't spend money unless I absolutely have to, like it's gotta be a solid investment and it's paid huge debt companies paid huge dividends for me. Um, yeah. It looks like the closest one to me is Branson, Missouri, which is about four hours away. <laughs> now they will. Uh, what you can do is you can buy online or call the company direct. And I mean, at four hours, I don't know if you're, what your options are. The other thing you can do is you can, you can basically, uh, they'll ship to the store. Um, okay. So, well, I mean, if I'm saving a couple of hundred dollars, it's oh yeah, not a bad thing to take a day, drive out there and come back. So I don't know what they're, I wonder what they have. Like they'll tell you what they have in their, man, when they stock up, they stock up and I'm talking tons and tons of tools. So like the rigid blower, I, or not the rigid, the Ryobi blower that they have on here. 
got it for 20 bucks. Okay. I bought yeah. a pressure washer for 50 bucks. It's just, if you're looking for cheap tools that you can maximize productivity with, strongly yep. recommend this company. I, I was just looking for a used one because as long as it works, I can get it in there and start learning the tool before I really have to get into production mode. I'm still, I'm trying to take kind of like the rest of this year to get this prototype all figured out. Right. And then see a way that I can actually start selling these next year and get into the big stuff. So then if I can get my investment started with cheaper tools now, earn some money, and then I can start investing yeah. in bigger stuff. Do you stuff. have one of these? No, I do not. I don't, I don't know that I have a need for something to clear out that much space right now. Now, so the reason where these make money, um, if you don't have a planer, is you basically, even if there is a bow, um, this will clear up that bow because it's all oh, this is the planer bit that goes in the router. And well, you when just I create a path that just goes back and forth, planing that bow out. Yeah. When, I, when I'm talking about a bow, I mean, I can press the board down into onto the waste board and just nail it in and it stays in. It's just, yeah. it's just, it's starting to curt. It's just the whole board over eight feet is starting to, to bow just a little bit. Yeah. And the small amount of areas when you're talking about a handle or, or even the side no, of the loom, it's the bow is not going to be a problem there. So you're, so you're actually not even cutting the board at all before you put it on the waste board. Right. Because my, my plan is to take a, a eight inch wide board and eight feet long and cut an entire loom out of one board. Something so that I it would take me forever to do by hand on like a scroll saw or something like that, all the curves and everything else. So here's, here's my recommendation. So I did the same thing with circles, right? Um, where I was trying to cut 15 circles out of a board at one time. Mm -hmm. What I was saving in time of having it run continuously didn't really pan out. Um, what I ultimately done is like you did that carbide create, right? Is mm -hmm. you create sections of it. You create that, that wasteboard uh, base where it just holds it up. And then you know what the center of your piece is, right? Take that eight foot board mark your center marks, cut the section, slide it over, cut the section, slide it over, cut the section. It takes very little time um, to do. And a couple of strips of frog tape, just holding it on the outside edges. I mean, you're talking, you're gonna only save less than a few minutes because I do that all the time with circles. I know that a 16 and three quarter inch circles is 435 millimeters to the left and right, right? From right. center to center. Um, so literally all I do is cut one hit X minus 435. The machine slides over. I hit play again, or set it to home, right? Reset work home and hit play again. And as the, the first one is, as, as the second one's cutting, I'm cutting it out the, the previous circle and taking it to my router table to clean up. Right. Because when you're doing all at one time where you're losing time is you don't want to touch that work piece, right? So right. if, yeah. if you touch that work piece, it's going to damage whatever's cutting right now. But if I cut them in sections, I'm actually able to continue the cleaning process as it's cutting the next piece. Gotcha. And then there's also times when I'm doing that where I slide the board. I don't even move the router at all. I grab my the, the work piece and I slide the whole work piece left or right. And I just mark the new and just move it to the new home point. Right. The other thing I would do is if you have your carbide create right your initial template cut it out of like eighth inch material right mm -hmm. um have it do just a barely a barely a pass just to mark it out so you see it and then take the bit to dead center to home and drive it all the way through your your, your template because now you know exactly where home is so you just if you're marking on a board you just take that template left and right pay put it in place take your pencil mark it and now you have a quick home spot that makes sense. Yep, it does. Yeah, that actually, uh, that does make it a lot saves of sense. me much much time because you're trying to when you're trying to measure out, especially on a circle, right? Yeah. Where exactly the next one can go? I just have my template circles cut out of Wayne's coat board that just somebody threw away and I we got a hold of, um, and straight up just put it just as soon as it was at home, on the circle I cut the circle, left it there, drilled it all the way through, this dead center, and now I know exactly where home is every time. So something I did was I actually took my waste board and I cut a vertical line and a horizontal line 
as a cross section for uh -huh. um, my home. And then on each one of those lines, every two inches, I did a little smaller line. I just cut it yep. with my machine. And so all I do is I just look at my board and I say, all right, one, two, three, four, five, you know, that's 10 inches over, slide it over. I put yep. it in that spot and I've got it. The, the thing is, is then, you know, trying to do that with an eight foot board and attach it to the waste board, everything wants to slip. That's oh, why I was okay. looking for, you know, like some sort of registration system in the waste board itself. I can put a little block down, kind of like what you were talking with the, the right angle cut out of a piece of waste. Um, and I can just slap a board that su gets supported on the waste board right there. And I just lay everything on top of it. Yep. And that so, was my plan. So that was another thing that I actually did. So if you bought, um, let me Google what they are called because I have them. I can't even think what they're called. They're V-bit. They're V -gro groove clamps. You know what I'm talking about? I may not be saying the right word. Hang on a second. Are you talking like the that. channels, the ones you can put, you can route the channel into the board? Yeah, they're V groove. They basically cut a V groove and. Yeah. One sec. Again, I don't think what they're called. One second, baby. I may have to go back to my purchases, but they're basically a one-sided clamp that slips into a V groove, if that makes any sense. Okay. Um, going back through my orders and see if I can find it real quick. Because I had them for a minute. Yeah, they're called micro jig uh, dovetail clamps. That's what it's called, dovetail clamp. I'll have to check those out. So all they are is like I said, they just slip into a dovetail. Um, and then you can take an eight foot sheet of uh, MDF, whatever thickness you want, or you can stack it, cut dovetail clamps. And that, you know, like your base, you can raise and lower that base, just slip it up and down and clamp it to your actual waste board. Okay. So you never have to screw anything in. Does that make any sense what I'm saying? So you can put a clamp yeah. on either side yep. of the end of it and it just slips up and down because that was my challenge. It's not all the time. Do I want my board to actually be at the bottom of my waste board? Right. Yes. And instead of having to zap it in every time, I just raise and lower that base. Yep. And see, I'm not even worried about the, like the corners. I'm not trying to get the full eight foot 100%. Uh, every single time. So I, I'm like, let's just make sure I can get the center of my area, you know, six, yep. seven feet wide accurate, which is I've, I've done that. And so I'm not worried about corners. I'm like, all right. So I just need to put everything in the middle every single time. Right. hundred percent. So I think your crosshair method is great. I would just add that little new base that you uh -huh. can slip up and down and it'll, it'll solve a lot of your problems. Okay. I will now you just have that, that thing. You can just, you know, you got the base that raises and lowers and you yep. just drop the board on top of it. Yeah. Now I've got four hours of work this afternoon while I think about this, instead of being able to get out there and on, onto my M2. <laughs> um, the other thing that I have done, and I've tested this as well. Um, so if you use the frog tape method, because I tested this, I didn't have scrap three quarter inch wood. Now I was cutting three quarter inch plywood. I used quarter inch plywood or a half inch plywood and did the frog tape method. And believe it or not, it held up just fine and kept the router from tipping. Okay. So you can use thinner stock at the edge of your thicker stock. As long as it's a, at least uh, probably a quarter to ha uh, the three quarter or a quarter to quarter inch or half inch, I mean, it'll it will the frog tape it'll lay flat because I mean obviously when you're taping it, I'll try to explain this. I don't know if you can see my screen. Yep, I can see it. When you're when you're taping it, this is the the the, the board you're cutting. Take this board and hold it at an angle, tape it, and then when it lays back, it'll lock into place. Does that oh make sense? yeah, mm -hmm. I get what you're saying. So it'll do the same thing with, with half inch wood. Okay. Give that a shot. Um, like I said, I've had great luck. And if your bit starts ripping up the tape at all, all I do is, is it passes over it. I take an uh, X-Acto knife real quick and zap off the, the, uh, the, the piece that gets frazzled. Because mm -hmm. sometimes the bit will cut through masking tape, you know, a little, little, little frizzle. Just rip it off and it keeps going just fine. Okay. Cool. Well, I got to get back to work. Um, but no, this has been very helpful. I, I look forward to working with you. If you get a chance, give me a call. Um, and I'll if I find you on Facebook, I'll send you a friend request. I'd okay. love to, I'd love to work with you further on it. Yeah, this sounds good. But all righty, man. Y'all take it easy. It's good talking you to you. You do the same. Right, have a nice afternoon. Bye.